1.30 uh, from Cruise. So if you have the time in your schedule, it would be great to see you back here as well. With that, I am very excited to announce our speaker for this morning, uh, Dr. Xavier Matrien. Uh, he's a co-founder and CTO of Cure, a Series B health tech startup. Previous to this, he led engineering at Quora and was a research engineering director at Netflix, where he started and led the algorithms team building the famous Netflix recommendations. If you were like me when um, uh, Xavier was at Netflix, you would have seen him being very, very active in the Rexis community. He's given like dozens of talks and really helped bring recommendation systems to the forefront. So huge thanks for that. We are all benefiting from the work that he put in uh, quite a while ago. Prior to this, he was a researcher in academia and industry. He has over 100 research publications. He's best known for his work on AI and machine learning in general, and recommender systems in particular. For the past five years at Curie, Javier has led teams at the intersection of product development and medical AI research and engineering. Curie has built an end-to-end -end virtual primary care service that provides high-quality medical care for under $10 a month, which is incredibly impressive. So thanks to its care delivery platform and state-of-the-art medical AI. That's on the research side, Cure focuses on medical language understanding and generation and multimodal medical reasoning. Um, as some of you who may have started your own startups or have worked in one can imagine, uh, life of a founder is incredibly busy and on, is always on call. So I'm incredibly grateful that Xavier made the time to uh, be here and to take the time to make the slides and to educate us about the exciting work he's doing. So with that, please extend a warm welcome to our speaker, Xavier. Thank you, Suju, and it's great to be back to in-person speaking. I hope I remember how this works, and I don't miss any of my Zoom background or buttons uh, to mute or something like that. Uh, but it's, I'm really happy to be talking about the work we're doing at Curie, and for this talk, I'm actually going to connect it to a lot of the things that I did in the past, right? I want to mention Anitha Kanan, who is our head of ML research, because a lot of the research work that I'm going to be talking about for um, Curi is led by her, and also because I shamelessly uh, stole some slides from her. She knows, so I, I, I did that with uh, her collaboration for sure, but I wanted to mention her name. So um, I think Suju um, already went through my background, so I don't need to go back through it. I, I will, looking back to some of the things I've, I've done, I remember like, oh gosh, I did a, a pretty popular recommender systems tutorial in KDD 2014. So yes, uh, that was already eight years ago. So I am pretty old and I go back to many years of working as a researcher initially with many publications, but then uh, I started leading teams at Netflix, Quora, and now at QRI. And this is a little bit of the outline of the talk. There's three different parts to the talk. The first one is I'm going to start with recommender systems, and I'm going to go back in history and talk a little bit about some of the things we did and the lessons we learned all the way back to the Netflix prize. Then I'm going to go into healthcare, and we're going to talk about what we're doing at Curie, but also connecting it and seeing some of the similarities and differences in using data and AI in this very different domain. And last and not least, I'm going to conclude with sort of what are some principles that I extract for, from so many years of working in this field, and particularly in user-facing products that have a strong backend in data and AI, but also have a user front end. And of course, uh, if you read the Dilbert cartoon in here, I'm going to hopefully convince you, and I'm sure you are already, that this is not what good data is, right? The good data is not the kind of data that tells you what you want to hear. Um, actually, that's probably the opposite of good data. So with that, um, I'm going to preview. This is th these are the principles that I told you I would finish with, but I just thought I'm just going to throw them up there first, and then we'll see how we get to them, right? So. Um, the first one is you have to make data trustworthy and accessible. The second one is follow 
hypothesis-driven design, both offline and online, and use clearly defined metrics. The third one, start from the simplest possible approach, and then ensure that your AI or your algorithms improve over time with data and metrics driving this improvement. That's the famous feedback loop. Number four, more data only matters if it's better data. And if the model is complex enough to actually learn from that better data. And then fifth, AI affects UX, the user experience, and UX affects AI. So we'll see how we get to those principles, but I just wanted to put them up in front and just tell you, like, this is going to be the context of many of the things we'll see. Um, with that, let's start with recommender systems. And I like to put this screenshot from an article that came out when I was leading uh, the machine learning algorithms team at Netflix because I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, this was not our headline. It was a journalist saying, Netflix uh, new my list feature knows you better than you know yourself because of algorithms. And this was referring to a particular feature that we launched at that time where the list of things that you wanted to watch, which originally was sorted manually by the user, we introduced an algorithm that would sort it for you. And we showed that removing the user and adding an algorithm actually um, improved results and people were using the feature much more. Now, um, this doesn't mean that algorithms are better than people or people are better than algorithms or it means that there's a very interesting connection between both, right? Between the user and the algorithms. It also means, and very importantly, we talked about that at that time already, was that AI, machine learning, data was all over the place, right? Every single part of the product in Netflix had some form of that. And uh, people used to mention, what is the Netflix algorithm? And I would tell them, there's not one, there's many algorithms. And there's obviously connections between those algorithms, but it's not a single one. So, okay. So this is a slide that I've used for many years and I keep updating it, but I, I like to remind people also because some of you newer generation maybe don't even remember the Netflix price, right? This was m many years ago. Um, but the Netflix price was, so this was 2006, so that was, uh, yeah, more than 15 years ago, 16 years ago, um, was a price in which Netflix put out a data set and said, whoever improves our baseline algorithm by 10% will get a million dollars. And it was very popular. There were thousands of people working on it around the world, including myself. I wasn't at Netflix at that point. I was in a research lab and I was like, gosh, this is super interesting. Let me work on it. Now, what was Netflix interested in when they put out this contest? Well, the main important aspect was the goal was to improve the product, right? They wanted to improve the product with data and AI. And the hypothesis, and I'll keep using this word over and over in the, in the presentation, was that higher quality recommendations would lead to higher member retention, right? That's a good hypothesis to have. If we have better recommendations, we'll have better retention, we'll have a better product that users like more. Now, because the notion of better recommendations is vague, you need a proxy question, right? Like, okay, what do we use? How do we measure that? Well, the proxy offline question was the accuracy in predicted rating. So there were some ratings that users were giving to movies, and at that time it was movies, and it was DVDs, by the way. Um, so there were ratings given to movies, and the proxy question was like, can I predict what rating is this person going to give to this other movie, right? And if you improve by 10% the baseline, there was, um, you got $1 million. The proxy metric was root mean square error of the predicted rating. Now, you see how there's sort of like levels of indirection here between the goal, the hypothesis, the proxy question, and the metric used to measure that proxy question. So you start adding levels of indirections, which are important to connect. 
Now we'll see what happened, right? I mean, the price at the end um, mm, had 107 different algorithms blended with a neural net on the ensemble layer. The top two algorithms was uh, singular value decomposition and restricted Boltzmann machines, which is a kind of neural network. However, um, of course, because there was an offline setting and people were working on it in a lab, the solution had many limitations. It was not designed to scale, first of all. It was um, not adaptable as new ratings were coming in, right? It was a very static algorithm. And then it had huge performance issues. It was very slow. So that came to us and to the Netflix team that was deploying into product and say, hey, good luck. Now build this into product. Um, so what happened next, or what happened at the end, and this has been uh, talked about a lot, and I have a blog post there on my blog that you can read if you want more detail, is that we decided that it was not worth it to deploy the final price ensemble of 107 uh, algorithms. The two winning algorithms were deployed, um, however, not, not the other 105, because it was not worth the engineering effort. And also, <laughs> very importantly, that's the third point, because we uncovered during that whole process that actually the proxy question and the offline experiment that was proposed, which again was predicting the rating and using RMSC as the metric, was wrong. <laughs> Basically, we were asking the wrong question. That's not the way to measure so how something on recommender systems is going to impact your users. And uh, that also was talked about in the recommender systems community for many years. And uh, slowly but surely, even the research community moved away from RMSC on predicted rating as the notion of success in terms of uh, recommender systems. So what were we interested on, or what was the evolution from that point in time, right? So we were initially in sort of recommender systems 1.0. We were in this unidimensional, I uh, use this analogy, right? Predict one rating, predict one number. And we realized that that was not what a good proxy question. We then evolved to ranking, and I'll talk about this uh, later. From ranking, then we went to page. It's not only a ranking, it's not a linear ranking, it's actually a two-dimensional space because the screen is two-dimensional. And then, or around that same time, there was this notion of, well, there's also context, right? It's a, it's a different dimension. It's like, it's not only the screen, it's like what time of the day it is, what device you're using, what context the user is on. And then you get into this kind of like, multi-dimensional space where you have to predict sort of like all these different, or you have to use all these different dimensions. Um, sorry, I'm having issues with the clicker, but um, um, this example of how to build a ranking model I think is, is very interesting, and I've also used it for some time. But if you imagine like what is the simplest personalized ranking model that you have to use, I like to use this very simple approach and talk to people about like, let's imagine that you have this hypothesis that there's two different features, two dimensions that matter for when somebody is going to like a movie or a show, right? One is the popularity. I mean, we're all affected like how popular a show is, but popularity is not personalized, so it's not gonna show something different to everyone, right? It's popularity is like for everyone is the same. The other one, is, well, we can use predicted rating. We have an algorithm that we have for free or for $1 million in the case of Netflix, and you can use it as a personalization aspect. You have to assume that, yes, the predicted rating matters in a way. It's not the only thing that matters, but it could matter in some way, right? So could use those two dimensions, and then you basically combine them in a linear model. I mean, it doesn't need to be linear, but linear is the easiest one. So I just say, okay, I'm gonna combine those two features. I'm gonna add some weights to them. I'm gonna say maybe popularity matters more than predicted rating, or it's the other way around. 
actually, I don't know, right? I need to infer those weights somehow. How do I infer those weights? Well, I infer those weights from the data. I have data from many users, and I can, say what they've, I can see what they've consumed, and I can infer whether popularity or rating matters more, and those W1 and W2 there in that linear formula, I can infer, right? So we're now going from the user to the data to the model. And then that gives me a very simple linear function with two features. I project those items into that linear model, and I get a final ranking. This is, you know, per person's approach to personalized learning to rank. But the m much more fancy approach is if you kind of like remove the layers of complexity, you have a similar thing, right? You have sort of like different elements, different features that go into predicting in a personalized way how to sort items in a list. And this is something that we published back then, that we're talking about more than 10 years ago. Of course, now it's completely different. And uh, these numbers refer to how the, the ranking improve over baseline when you use only popularity, you added ratings only, so that's uh, the two-dimensional model that I just described. And then when you added more features and you optimize the model, that's the improvement. And of course, the lesson here is like, well, you get a little bit of improvement as soon as you personalize a little bit, but then as you add more and more personalization, more data, more features, and you improve the model, you can get a lot more, right? Now, how to get there is something we'll talk about, right? How to get to the, to the last line on the graph, the over 200% improvement. Now, I also want to, I'll be throwing in examples from the different places that I've worked at, and I just want to highlight that in domains where our, uh, you could think that are pretty different, right? The Quora feed, for those of you, the, you who use Quora, is just a set of stories that are sorted for you and are personalized. When you open Quora, you get that, which is similar to, say, what a Facebook feed or a Twitter feed could be. Uh, Quora is much, I would say, complex because stories can be both questions, answers, story, uh, news, links that have been shared. But in any case, the, the idea is very similar, right? You have a goal of presenting the most interesting stories at the top for the user. So it is a ranking, it's items. And um, interesting is defined as a combination of different things, right? Like the topical relevance, the social re relevance, the timeliness is very important, right? If something is very old, it could be less interesting that it's very new. Uh, the model is another personalized learning to rank. It's not as simple as the, as the baseline that I described, which is uh, just, just a linear model, but um, it's another personalized learning to rank. And then the, revel uh, the relevance, once you, we use that kind of personalized learning to rank with the different features added, was had huge improvements, uh, similar to the Netflix ones, to just doing a time order relevance, which I don't know that that's true, say, for Twitter, but I can speculate that because they push so hard for a personalized feed versus the time order feed, I'm pretty sure that they also saw the same improvements in terms of engagement and how much users engage with the product. As I mentioned before, Ranking is not the ultimate thing. From ranking, you go to then page. You have a page that has different lists that are combined in different ways. There's different components. And depending on the kind of product you have, the attention of the user is going to be driven in a different way, and you have to take that into account. And not only that, uh, that that's from a thesis from Dimitri Lagoon in 2014 that only looked at the different attentions models across different kinds of products. But if you have different devices, it's the same thing, right? So it's not the same attention pattern if you're on a phone than if you're in a big TV screen or in your laptop. And all of that matters in how you are going to have to optimize your page. OK, so we saw sort of like some examples and some um, ideas of like how we went uh, in recommender systems from this unidimensional rating prediction world to ranking 
to then page, and how the algorithms feed back to the user experience and the user experience feedbacks to the user. So I'm going to change gears completely and go to healthcare. And I'm going to talk about how we use data AI in a context where we have algorithms, we have users, and we're trying to build, obviously, a better uh, healthcare experience, better outcomes, and uh, use AI and data to build that. I put this here on, uh, on the, um, on the um, section slide because this is, a, this is a summary of the FDA's machine learning as a software device program, which interestingly was presented here at a workshop on Sunday. So we had somebody from the FDA talking about it. And I also have a blog post where I talk about this. But this is, this is very interesting. Uh, I'd recommend for anyone working in the intersection of AI and healthcare to look at it because they have a plan and a proposal for how we're going to be treating AI algorithms as devices and they're going to be regulated by the FDA. In fact, there's a few of them that have already gone through the process. And that's something that I keep in the back of my mind, but it's, it's very interesting how they talk about data, about the validation of the data, about how the data feeds back, and how that's going to be regulated to make sure that we're doing the right thing. OK, so just to set a little bit of context of what I'm going to be talking about, I think um, most people are probably aware of you know, how many problems we have in healthcare in the world today and how Im important and urgent it is to address them, right? There's like 50% of the world with lack of access to essential healthcare. There, and people might think like, well, that doesn't happen in the US. Well, in the US, there's 30% of adults who are uh, underinsured. And mm, there's a shortage of 100, predicted shortage of 120,000 physicians by 2030, that's only the US. It's even worse in other parts of the world. So we just don't have access. We are predicting we're going to have less physicians over time. And things, unless we apply sort of like technology and innovation to them, they're not going to get better. And to make matters worse, well, on the one hand, we live longer, so we need more care. On the other hand, we have more diseases coming our way. We have COVID, right? That's uh, something that we saw had a huge impact in, in the world. And um, in the context of COVID particularly, there's been a lot of talk about, well, we should move to a more virtual environment for healthcare, right? We, uh, we've done that for work. We now work from home. Uh, can we do something similar? So telehealth seems sort of like an interesting avenue for that. And that's something we're doing at QRI, and we'll talk about it. It's very important also to understand that there's a lot in the current system, not in telehealth, there's a lot of mistakes being made, right? So it's not only about lack of access, it's about the mistakes that are being made because doctors don't have time. Uh, the average uh, physician visit time is 15 minutes in the US, and in 15 minutes they need to capture the data, they need to analyze, they need to remember what they studied back in school, make a diagnosis, give a prescription to the patient, and then hope that they see the patient maybe in three months. So that, that, doesn't, doesn't, that approach doesn't make sense, right? So we're tracking, trying to tackle all those approaches. And we're doing that by doing a mobile first approach where you have your access to healthcare in your cell phone 24 seven. And in a way that makes it accessible and affordable, right? So we're trying to reduce cost, remove a lot of the redundancy and all the middleware that happens that makes healthcare expensive, but at the same time, increase quality, right? Because we don't want to make it cheaper and worse quality. We think, and the hypothesis is, using AI data and algorithms, both things can be tackled at the same time. More accessibility and more quality, because we can have the assurance that we're making the right decisions. Um, and then it's an always learning system, and uh, we are feeding back the data from the system into the algorithms. We talk about AI not as replacing doctors or mm, nothing like that, but basically as AI 
we presented as just another member of the care team. You know, care team is made of doctors, it's made of nurses, you have assistants, you have even a receptionist when you go to the hospital, right? Well, the AI is one of those members, and it's just not replacing anyone, it's helping in different ways. So our AI algorithms work both in a user-facing way. So this is, this is our app. So this is a screenshot of the patient view. This is what you will see if you download QRI Health on your phone today. You'll see the patient view. And this is your app, which is mostly chat-based. And this is the provider view. So on the other side, the doctors also have a much more complex application where they're getting uh, help from the AI. And the AI sometimes will step up, talk to the patient, ask questions, then tell the doctor things, help the doctor when the doctor's making a diagnosis, and it's just another member of the medical team. So that's a little bit of the context um, and how some of the research that we pr I'll be presenting sort of like helps in this context. There have been a lot of breakthroughs in AI in healthcare over the past years. This is just a bunch of papers that are not from QRI, but are from different research groups, from Google to DeepMind to Stanford to different places where there's been sort of like a lot of usage of novel AI techniques, um, deep learning in particular for things like x-rays or um, analyzing your eye, but also an NLP and text that we'll, look, we'll see in some of the examples that we use at QRI. So at QRI, one of the things we've done, sorry, oh yeah, since day one is really consider that um, state-of-the-art research was going to be something fundamental, even at, at, in a startup like us. Uh, we are still pretty early, Series B, but we started doing research from day one, and we actually combine a lot of the product development, which you saw before, with research. This is our, a few of our research publications. We do research in basically these three areas, medical reasoning and diagnosis, uh, NLP and conversational AI, and then multimodal AI, adding images and other modalities into the conversation. A very important aspect and a very important difference between what I talked about at Netflix before and what I'm going to be talking now about QRI and, and AI in healthcare is that healthcare is a very knowledge intensive domain. What that means is that there's a vast history going back centuries of knowledge that has been captured about things in healthcare, including, for example, conditions, symptoms that lead to conditions, drugs that work, drugs that don't work. There's a lot of knowledge that it's known to be truth, true knowledge that is known to be not true. And that is very, very relevant at every single step in the healthcare process, which honestly it's not so true in the context of recommending movies or TV shows, right? What is the truth? It's like, well, do you like it? Do you, do you don't like it? Is it true that this is a thriller? Who cares, right? Like, not, not a big deal. So in healthcare, that's not the case. It, it, it is very knowledge intensive. And there's medical terminologies. There's um, expert systems that have been used for many years, for 50 years. And we'll talk about them in some of the examples where uh, there's knowledge bases that have been designed and have thousands of uh, conditions and relations between conditions. And there's books written on anatomy, right, and parts of the body and how they connect and the things that can happen to the part. That's all very, very important. Um, so a very key aspect for us in our research and what we do is how do we use all the advances of the most modern state-of-the-art AI techniques deep learning, and others like language models, large language models that we'll talk about. But we're aware that we need to inject some of this knowledge and the guardrails that make sure that we're making the right decisions, right? So that's, it's very important for, for healthcare, but 
if you've been following discussions in general in AI, it's very important for AI in, ge in general, right? It's not only healthcare. There are a lot of domains where having this notion of knowledge and truthfulness, it, it is relevant. And uh, for example, some of the big language models like Lambda from Google were already trained to have a notion of like truth and uh, Facebook just released another uh, language model which also claims to be more truthful using some retrieval techniques. So that's, it is very, very true for uh, healthcare. So I'm gonna talk about different components of our system, which again, think about the picture that I said, the AI is a part of the medical system and uh, of our medical care team. And I'm gonna give you three examples on how and where is the AI part of the medical team. One example is differential diagnosis, right? So in differential diagnosis, the goal is you have some inputs, you have some symptoms, some lab tests, some things you know, and you're trying to come up with a list of possible conditions and have a diagnosis for the patient of like what could be going, going on. This is a very, very important aspect of medicine in general, and so much that if you talk to mm, doctors, by the way, I should have mentioned, like not half, but almost half of our whole team at Curie are doctors, so we have doctors in the team, so we work with them hand in hand. And we even have doctors who write code, which is like mind boggling for me, but th there are some of those. Um, but um, if you talk to doctors, they'll, they'll tell you, even in the medical conversation, as soon as a patient walks in and starts talking to them, the first thing their mind goes to is like, okay, let me just start building hypotheses of what could be going on, right? And then they start asking more questions to say, oh wait, and they start updating their prior beliefs like, okay, no, this might not be the flu, it actually could be COVID, and they ask for a test, and then they get the test result, and they keep updating sort of like the, uh, the list of this differential. So it's a very, very uh, well-known technique in the context of just human medical practice, and we're trying to do that with an assisted sort of like algorithm behind the scenes, right? So we have done quite a lot of work on that, um, this is a couple of papers that you can look up if you're interested in sort of like some of the details of what I will be um, talking about. Um, just highlight maybe this graph here. So this was um, in, sorry, let me, this was 2020, right? Yeah, in 2020, it was the first time that we got our algorithm to surpass what is known, at least in the only public data set that we have, which is a set of clinical vignettes, as the average accuracy from a doctor, right? So our algorithms offline have better accuracy in top three diagnosis than the average human doctor. Now, that doesn't mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, fields where AI has already so like better accuracy than the average human, and that doesn't mean that you can just throw the humans away and put the AI, right? But it, it is a very interesting data point, so I wanted to highlight it. Now, how do we do that? Um, so we do this very, I think, unique, but also interesting, and I, I keep pushing like this is something that could be used outside of healthcare and in other areas, which is the combination of expert systems and deep learning I just have machine learning models because it could really be anything, but it, it's, in our case, it, was, it is convolutional neural nets. But this notion of combining expert systems, which is the old school AI, so an expert system is basically a knowledge base, right, where you input some data, and uh, the knowledge base, because it has some probabilities, you can infer um, and you can, there's different techniques. You can use, just use Bayesian networks, for example, to infer from the knowledge base. But you, you basically infer the result from uh, what's going on by computing the probabilities, the most likely probability of what's happening. It's a very static model. It's very hard to update. It's, you need to manually keep the probabilities up. And actually, they're, they're encoded manually by doctors looking 
at the different literature and updating the probabilities. So it really doesn't scale, but it's very knowledge intensive. There's a lot of good knowledge in there. So what we did is we used the expert system and the knowledge base to simulate data. So instead of using it to infer results, what we did is generate a lot of data, which at the end of the day, they're just clinical cases. So we generated clinical cases by exciting different nodes in the knowledge base and creating data. And then we train a, neural, a deep neural net on the generated synthetic data. Now, why would you want to do that? Um, well, the first thing, surprisingly, is that you can get better results by just doing this process than what you would get directly from the expert system, which is fascinating, but it is true. Second is you can then do something very interesting, which is you can combine your synthetic data with natural data. So now you are combining synthetic data, which is injecting knowledge, right? It's injecting prior knowledge with real world data, which doesn't have knowledge, but it's real, right? And you know that that's how things are. And then you can train your model and combine that data in different ways. And that's something that we did. Uh, the third technique that you can use, which is a little bit more involved, but you can do, is you can add noise to the simulated data in ways that you can expect to, uh, to recreate the noise that exists in real life. For example, something we did which gave us good results is we added um, symptoms that are very prevalent, meaning that they happen to many people, say fever, right? Because they're so common or cough, you can just inject them randomly in conditions just to say, you know what? It's like this is so common that it could be happening because of some other reason and it could be a co-founder for making the right decision. So injecting noise um, in, with some sort of like logic and some uh, anticipation of the real world actually also helps in the end results. So this is, this is uh, an approach that we've used. And again, this notion of creating synthetic data from knowledge bases, which actually could also be knowledge graphs, and then adding real world data and then training a machine learning model in it, I think it's very interesting and a very good way to inject knowledge, as I was saying before, into our deep learning models. We actually did the same thing. Uh, once COVID hit, we, did, we thought, wow, this is a, a, a very interesting and very uh, an exact use case where we can use our technique and see if it works, right? Because the expert systems which have been developed in the past and we are using, don't have COVID, <laughs> right? They haven't modeled COVID. So that is uh, obviously a miss. And COVID is a very tough disease in the sense that it does intersect a lot and has a lot of commonalities with a lot of diseases that have been modeled in the past, particularly the flu, right? So if you really go into the pre-model um, expert system or knowledge base, all the probabilities that are there have gone down the drains because of COVID, COVID, right? Because like now COVID becomes sort of like a very important node in the network and you have to either just throw everything away and recompute the probabilities or you're, it doesn't work. So we, did, we said, okay, we're gonna use our technique and we basically did the same thing. We created synthetic data from the pre-existing expert system, but then when we introduce natural data, we introduce COVID-19 data. So we injected natural data coming from COVID-19, and then uh, we trained a model uh, on the combination. Sorry, I saw a hand go up very quickly. I want to take the question. Just how do you combine the synthetic data with the real data? Is it one case that you're taking some facts from the synthetic data and then you augment them with real data? Or you are just going in a set of cases that were from synthetic and a set of cases Yes, great question, and yes, it is the latter. We, we do cases, so we have clinical cases, and then we have the same format for the synthetic ones and for the natural ones, and we combine them at the case level, yeah. And this particular ones, uh, at this point, our service was already working, 
So we were injecting COVID cases from our own service. So we, we didn't have to go out and sort of like get them from the internet or from another healthcare system. We were already receiving them internally. Uh, there's a lot of data here, but the, the bottom line is that, and, and this paper, which is about sort of like this notion of how to, how to design systems that know what they don't know, um, and uh, sort of like out of, um, out of uh, based uh, decision making. This, in this case, what we were measuring, which was very important, is okay, we, it's obvious that we can train a better model for COVID if we do this technique, right? So obviously the previous model didn't know about COVID, the one now knows about COVID, but that was not the question we were answering here. The quen question here is like, but does the resulting model become worse for a previous existing uh, diseases, right? Because that's very important. You might be injecting a new disease and now you know about COVID, but everything that was trained before becomes worse. And the answer is no. And uh, anyway, I, I won't go into over the numbers, but we, we do have sort of like better accuracy than uh, the average physician still. And we don't see a reduction in accuracy by adding COVID to pre-existing diseases that were already modeled before. Uh, okay, I'm, I, I'm gonna move on because I, I, see, I think I'm taking way too much time. Okay, for conversational history taking, this is another example where we have the AI talking to the patient and gathering history and asking questions and then using those questions to inform the differential diagnosis that we just saw and also inform the doctors who are in the back end of what could be going on. This is an example of a conversation, right? This is the kind of conversation that you could expect, and I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm just gonna leave it up here for a couple of seconds. But you see, there's a, the conversations that we're talking about, because their patient is part of them, they're not you know, high-level medical conversation. So this is a very different kind of conversation or text that would, you would find in medical notes in an EHR. Medical notes in an EHR are written in medical language. This has medical language, a little bit of it, but other parts are just like somebody trying to explain themselves about how much their st stomach hurts, or they could use stomach, they could use belly, they could, they, they're trying to explain themselves, right? So we use lang uh, large language models for some of this because everyone knows lang large language models are awesome, right? It's like they've done their state of the art for so many things, so why wouldn't you use them, right? And we are using large language models like GPT-3 for much of the things that we're doing right now in the conversational engine. And language models are great to, they adapt to a broad range of uh, situations, right? You can talk to GPT-3 about how you're feeling and uh, whether you're sick or not, but you can talk to them about soccer and about movies. And it actually has a, can have a conversation that sounds very realistic, and it's engaging. Um, and it kind of like sounds natural, right? That's also very important, as opposed to a traditional, say, chatbot. Now, they're not great at staying truthful, right? They hallucinate knowledge, and the problem is they sound so well <laughs> that you trust them, right? They're like, oh gosh, this sounds like this uh, person knows what they're saying, but they don't. They're just making it up. And uh, they're also bad about dealing with long range dependencies in conversation. So if you mentioned you had a headache at the beginning, and now you're talking about um, how you can't sleep, the language model doesn't remember that you said at the beginning that you had a headache, right? They're just now very local. Uh, in, in, in making decisions and in the conversation. And then in reasoning in general, right? In, in, in having sort of like knowledge-based uh, decisions and retrieving, they retrieve knowledge because they have a lot of knowledge and in, in they've learned in their many, many parameters they have in the model, but they can't really uh, understand or reason about it. 
So what we do is combine these techniques, like large language models, with um, different techniques. So basically, um, we have this um, structure. We have natural language understanding, natural language generation, where we use a lot of the large language models techniques. But then we have uh, conversation tracking, and we have um, the next finding, where basically the conversational engine is trying to uh, figure out what is the next thing that they should get out of the conversation, right? So this is almost, if you think about it, similar to the old slot filling technique. But here, this is driven by a knowledge base and also by this notion of having a differential diagnosis in the back end, saying, okay, I think this could be um, you know, a UTI, but I need to get more information in order to decide. And that's driving, which is very knowledge intensive, is driving then most of the conversation. And also, very importantly, there is an emote component which is able to detect the emotion in the conversation and adapt to it because if you just are blindly sort of like following a path and generating sort of like questions that are driving to a solution, in many cases, that is going to drive the user away, right? So, and, and we've, we have a lot of, uh, we have a paper on this. I think I, I listed it somewhere uh, on one of this. But we, we see a lot of different, like if a patient tells you something like, gosh, I have the, the worst headache of my life. I think I, I'm dying. And you just say, and the next thing you say, OK, do you have fever? That is, sounds really bad, right? So you have to acknowledge what the patient is saying, respond to it, saying, hey, I'm sorry to hear you're feeling so bad. Um, let me ask you another question. And that sort of like generates a lot more, not only uh, engagement, but a lot of more trust and then truthfulness in the interactions. Um, finally, we also have another component. So the AI, at the end of the, of the, um, of the encounter, also steps up and summarizes everything that has gone into the whole conversation and hands it over to the EHR, which is then going to be used. EHR, by the way, I should maybe, for those who are not in uh, healthcare, it's electronic health record. So it's your electronic representation of everything that has happened uh, to you, medically speaking, over your history. Um, so the, the AI summarizes all the encounter, everything that has happened, everything that is relevant, and then puts it into a medical note for the doctors to use uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, for medical summarization, we also use large language models, mm, like GPT-3. We actually have uh, one paper over there about medically aware GPT-3, which is specifically using GPT-3. Um, and one of the insights is these language models can be prompted to generate pretty good medical summaries, right? So if you use the right prompt, they're very good. And prompt engineering is one of the things that I've been talking for some time that it's going to become sort of like a huge thing, right? It's like if you use the, the wrong prompt, you don't get much out of the language model. If you engineer the right prompt, you end up sort of like getting a lot more knowledge and the right kind of knowledge. So in the case of summarization, it, it matters, and you can produce very good um, summaries. Now the insight, the second insight, is that you can ensemble language models to produce a more truthful and better summary. Now that's an interesting one, and we, we, uh, we did some really interesting experiments. Language models don't always produce the same output, right? Even if you send the same prompt, they produce different outputs because that's the way the model works, and that's how they sound natural. Now, the interesting thing in medicine, because you know there could be truth or there could be hallucination, you can use techniques to basically excite the large language model to generate different outputs, 
and then ensemble those in a way that you're favoring the truthful ones and pushing back the ones that are not truthful. So you can introduce knowledge at the ensemble level, which is something that is, I think, also pretty unique and pretty interesting. Um, and that's, that's actually the third insight, that you can inject domain knowledge at this step to actually uh, create more truthful and more medically truthful summaries. And this is basically what we, what we did in this uh, research work. And we basically use an ensemble of GPT-3s to generate data. And here we go again, sort of like using kind of like models to generate data and then to train other, other models, right? So that's uh, similar to what we do with the expert systems. But in this case, the generator is not an expert system. It's GPT-3. And then we train an ensemble by labeling sort of like the truthful and the non-truthful summaries. And then we see a huge improvement on the results when they're judged by medical professionals, right? That's the, the important sort of like the, the goal here is to have medical prof professionals say that they actually uh, think that it's a good summary. This is a, an example of um, results that we get on only doctor label, uh, a model trained only on doctor label, a model trained only in GPT-3 ensemble, and then the, bet, the better one, which is the combination of the GPT-3 ensemble with doctor labels that are then used to give weights to that ensemble. OK, so I, I want to apologize. I know that I'm over time a little bit, but I was told that because there's not another session, I could go a little bit over time. So I hope you are, you're OK with me taking a few more minutes. But I'm, I'm almost done at, at this point. Um, I'm going to talk now, finally, right? We've seen examples of using AI in this sort of like user-facing uh, products and how to drive sort of like this algorithms, how to drive better uh, outcomes and, and better user experiences. And I'm going to talk now, go back to this notion of principles. And before I do that, though, I'm going to motivate it by trying to answer this question, right? What do I need? Do I need more data? Do I need better data? Do I need better algorithms? Do I need all of it? How, how does this, how do, how do I reason about this? And this is also something that is very important because in both of the examples we saw, right, both in the Netflix example, but even more so in healthcare, it's like a lot of people think like, I can't start doing AI in healthcare because there's no data. There's a lot of, uh, concern about like there's no data, there's no good data, and um, it's hard to come by to get the, the right kind of data, right? So how, how does that matter and how should we think about it? And when talking about this, I always, similar to the Netflix prize, go back in history, right, and, and talk about a few examples here about when there was a moment in time which was, this was probably like 15 or, yeah, between 10 and 15 years ago, where there was this notion, you know, it's when everyone talked about big data. And it was all about more data, right? And Peter Norvig wrote about Google does not have better algorithms. We only have more data. And there was a famous unreasonable effectiveness of data paper where one of the examples was this paper by Banco and Brill, where they showed that using very different algorithms, the performance really only depended on the size of the data. The, the different algorithms from a simple uh, perceptrum to more comp or naive based to more complicated models, they basically had the same performance in their case. And also, a very interesting blog post that happened during the Netflix Prize, where they uh, a professor that was teaching at Stanford was talking about how more data beats better algorithms. And he had his students train uh, predictions to the Netflix prize by using metadata from the movies. And he showed that in his case, it actually produced better results. 
So is it really true that it's all about more data? Well, it turns out that we have a lot of counterexamples where that's not the case. In particular, for example, for the example I just mentioned, for the a rating prediction in the Netflix case, uh, Netflix price, just right after that blog post came, research started looking into, a, into it and ended up concluding that no, actually metadata does not help. So more data in that case did not help. And the only reason it helped is because the algorithms that were being used were bad. So if you have bad algorithms, then maybe adding more metadata helps. But if you use the right algorithms, it doesn't help. There's um, also, uh, well, this is a paper we published at Curie where we also uh, showed how adding more conversational data does not help in many cases for getting better summarization. And this is uh, a graph that we published many years ago at Netflix when we were doing ranking, when we showed that the ranking ac accuracy actually did not move at all as we kept adding millions and millions of data points. And this was another example. Now, is it true that always better, oh, by the way, I need to uh, maybe refer to this one. Yeah, this is, the, this is the famous, and I'm saying famous is because I've heard it in the conference mentioned a few times, the big data paradox. This is um, a nature paper that appeared very recently that refers to it and proves that in some cases, adding more data actually decreases the accuracy of the models that are being trained, right? So that's the big data paradox. So there's a lot of counterexamples where more data actually doesn't help. And I put this hugging face of like 10,000 state-of-the-art models picture here because that's another counterexample where you don't need a lot of data to tra train a language model because it has already been trained for you. <laughs> All you need is a little bit of data to maybe prompt or fine tune the model and you can go from there and you already have sort of like a really sophisticated model so you don't need that much data. So how do we think when do you really need more data? When do you not need more data? Um, and the other question is, well, how about bigger models, right? Because it might be that all you need is bigger models, and there are some examples where you do. For example, this is a fascinating paper, the emerging abilities of language, large language models, where they show that there's the actual uh, performance on a variety of tasks like Q&A, uh, summarization or why not is basically linear until you reach a saturation point and all of a sudden the performance jumps a lot, right? So it's like this language models, um, sorry, uh, this is the number of parameters. Uh, I think I, 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 meant, I said data, but I meant parameters. This is the number of parameters that the model has. As you start increasing it, all of a sudden the performance jumps uh, in a way that it's still unexplained. Uh, there's some hypothesis that might be related to the double descent uh, effect, which is also kind of starting to be understood, but it's not clear. Um, so yes, in this case, it is about b bigger models in the case of language, um, uh, language models. Um, there are other counterexamples uh, where, for example, in this paper, they show that a lot of the results that have been published recently using deep neural nets in recommender systems, they're actually, they cannot be reproduced. They try to reproduce them and they end up concluding that most of them are uh, either flaws or they're not really uh, reproducible in many ways and simpler models actually have the same or better results. And we had a similar situation. We published this paper here on diagnosis, and we also found out that in some situations, bigger models like deep neural networks were actually not more accurate than much more simpler, even logistic regressions. So there's this kind of like conflict of like, when do you need more data? When do you need uh, more models? When do you need larger models? Because there's conflicting kind of information about it, right? So I'm going to try to 
uh, address this in some of the principles, and in particular, in this slide, I think the big data paradox is not such a paradox, right? So the notion that when you add more data, you're gonna get better results just by definition doesn't make sense, right? There's a couple of really important things that need to go hand in hand. First of all, not all data is good data, right? So if by adding more data, you're adding worse data, your results are gonna be worse, right? So you need to really keep in mind, and the Nature paper is actually basically saying that, where they say, well, there's survey data, and the survey data is very noisy, and the more noisy data that you add, your accuracy goes down, because your estimates are worse, right? So yes, if you add worse data, you're gonna get worse results, right? So when you think about adding more data, you need to think about, am I adding better data? And am I adding sort of like different data? Now, very importantly, that's uh, only true, um, sorry, not only true, but it's also true and depends on the complexity of the model, right? So even if you add better data, if your model is very simple and is not able to learn more because it's already saturated, you're not going to uh, really learn more. So you need to increase the complexity of your data at the same, uh, the, the, sorry, the size of your data at the same time that you increase the complexity of your model. So for example, the um, figure that I was showing before here about the Netflix ranking system not improving as you add data, in hindsight, it was only true because our model was too simple. <laughs> if we had a more complex model, this would have increased over time, right? So if you saturated your model and can learn more, it doesn't matter if you add more data, even if that data is better, right? So you need to keep in mind sort of better data, more complex models, and then the final sort of caveat to that is that um, this really does not hold true. The bias and variance trade-off doesn't really hold true for very large parameterized models like the language models. And some of the effects that we see, for example, the one that I showed by adding uh, the fact that making a more and more complex, uh, more parameters, all of a sudden the performance jumps, it's still unknown and it's fascinating, but it's something that uh, I need to add this caveat that sometimes uh, this is not always true. Now, if you look at history though, one thing that is undeniable is that better data leads to better models, right? So that connection exists for everything, including deep learning, right? So uh, this is a, a history of sort of like breakthroughs in AI and when the data sets, different data sets were available, right? And you see sort of a very strong connection between when the data sets appear and when the breakthroughs are happening versus when the algorithms existed. I mean, algorithms, deep neural nets existed many years ago, but they were not showing uh, any promise in some of the applications until ImageNet appeared, for example, right? So this connection between data, you need both. You need the algorithm and the data, but you need to connect them in order to have that breakthrough. Now, sorry. It is not only about data and models, right? We were talking about data, models, and a lot of the conversation has been about the combining these two things. But it's, it's, there's a few things that I wanna highlight that is uh, very important, right? The first one is what are you optimizing for? What is your obje objective function? And how, what's the metric that you're optimizing for? You could have a really good data really good algorithm, but if you're optimizing for the wrong metric or you have the wrong objective function, you're gonna be learning the wrong thing. You are gonna learning, be learning well, but you're gonna be learning the wrong thing, right? Um, 
So for example, uh, this, this graph for here is showing you the different response of different ranking met, uh, metric, like mean reciprocal rank, fraction of concordant pairs, and others to the position on the ranking. So some ranking uh, metrics are really optimizing the head of the ranking, and they really focus on like getting it right at the beginning. Some others are more linear, and they don't care. They want to get sort of like an overall good ranking. That's going to matter. If you optimize or one or the other, you're going to get a different ranking. And it really depends. In some cases, you need one or you need the other. Uh, in the case of the Quora feed that I mentioned before, um, the target function that we're trying to optimize for was the value of showing a story to a user. And the value is like, that's another important thing. Like, how, what, what does it mean? What's the value of, of uh, a story? Well, in the case of Quora, of Quora our value was the combined weight of a set of actions. Each of the actions had a value that we knew from a business perspective and from what matter to the product. Maybe upvoting a question or answering a question had a different value. Which one do we value more? Well, we encode that in the objective function that we're trying to optimize for. And then we compute the probability of each of the, those given the set of stories, and that's what's being optimized for. So objective function and metric matters besides only data and models. Something else that matters very much is the UI. The user interface is key. <laughs> Sometimes it's so key that it matters more than whether your algorithm is producing the right result. For example, explanations that you add to why you're making a recommendation matters a lot, and in some cases, you're able to get people to click and watch something just because you're telling me, hey, trust me, this is very good, or because you're telling me, everyone else in the US likes this movie, you better watch it, and you, you are convinced, and you watch it. But it, it's the same thing in healthcare, right? If you're just telling the patient, this is what you have, and you eat, you need to stop eating so much sugar, I mean, you better give them a compelling reason, right? <laughs> it's like, unless you give a good explanation and you convince them, you might be right in the diagnosis and the treatment, but you need to have a good explanation. So that's a very key aspect of sort of like the whole connection between the user and the, uh, sorry, and the, the, the AI and the, and the product. And, sorry. Very important, the importance of the experimentation framework. And I see Ronnie taking a picture. <laughs> we have Ronnie Kohabi here, who's the expert on, on this. But um, it's this notion of combining, of having a, a, the right experimentation framework, where you're use, putting all this together, right? We, you, you have a metric, you have data, you have an algorithm, you're experimenting with it, you're measuring progress, and then very importantly, you're doing that both offline and online. Why? Well, online A-B testing is great, it's amazing, but it's costly. I mean, you can't do that, say, 10 times in a day. Offline experimentation, you can. You, if you have the right tooling in the lab, you're gonna have your uh, machine learning researchers, data scientists, engineers, doing 10 experiments a day and figuring out what's going on. And that's a very agile way to explore if you have the right data, the right algorithm, and the right metric. And once you have that, you go into A-B testing and you make sure that what you measure in the lab actually correlates to a good uh, result in your product. Um, very important is, uh, I mean, you have to have this overall evaluation criteri criteria which is ideally a long-term metric, right? You, you don't want to optimize for the click. I mean, that's really, we know, we, we know that that doesn't drive too uh, much good. You want to optimize for long-term something, long-term engagement in the case of recommender systems and user satisfaction, long-term health results in the case of healthcare. Yeah? You just don't want to give the pill that is going to make you feel better today if that's going to hurt you in six months. Um, now, 
the problem with long-term metrics is they're very hard to measure <laughs> in any case, right? And in a product like Netflix or Quora, and in healthcare, it's like it's hard. You have to wait a long time, right? So there's a lot of work and a lot of interesting work on how do you find proxies, proxy metrics that can be measured short-term that correlate well to long-term. In fact, I put this little paper here which I saw in the first day of the poster session, I'm like, oh, that's a good example for this slide. Uh, this was presented by a group, uh, this is a Google paper, and they talk about surrogate for long-term user experience in recommender system. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's exactly what I'm gonna be talking about in this slide. So even in this year's KDD, you will find papers about this. How do you find surrogate shorter-term metrics that actually correlate well? To long term. In, the, in their case, not surprisingly, they found out that the best surrogate for long term user satisfaction in the short term was diversity of content consumed. So that was, uh, when I saw that, I, I was talking with the authors in the poster and I, and I nodded and said, yeah, that's, I can see that happening. It's, it's the, how much different content you can get the user to consume will correlate in the long term to their satisfaction and to their engagement. But anyway, this notion of offline experimentation with metrics, online experimentation with A-B tests and metrics, and being able to correlate both worlds is really, really important. So with that, I'll now finish with going to the principles, right? Everything that we've seen and everything we've talked, how does this line up? And I'll uh, first sort of like give you a set of uh, different statements and then I'll, I'll wrap up with going back to the principles I showed up at the beginning, right? So first, you need to make data trustworthy, right? You need to be able to trust the data. It's not only about more data, it's about data that is good, and you have to make sure that you're getting data that you've, as much as possible, remove the noise, remove the artifacts, remove the biases that it might have, and that people that are using it can trust. Now, you also need to make data accessible because if you have a lot of data but you know, people cannot use it and your team cannot use it, 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 it's just the same as if you don't have it. You have to follow a hypothesis-driven approach and that means you have to formulate questions before you actually capture the data to answer the questions. Doing post hoc analysis of data is usually, sometimes you can't do anything else, but, uh, and it's inevitable, but in most cases, it's a recipe for a disaster. So just basically looking at the data and saying, oh, I see a pattern. That's kind of like a, a very uh, bad practice that leads to finding patterns that don't exist post hoc, right? You need to be able to act the other way around. Make a hypothesis and saying, hey, this is my hypothesis. If I do this, this will happen, and then you measure it. Now, in order to measure it, you need to have clear metrics that are well-defined and that actually map to what you want to measure, right? And we saw the example of ranking metrics that some of them might be very much focused on the head, some of them might be more linear. You need to understand that different metrics are gonna have different effects. You have to measure offline and online to have this sort of like double loop of sort of like learning. And then on the AI front, you need to make sure that data and metrics drive AI, right? So AI is not going on its own. It's like you have data that flows into AI and metrics that is telling you if this algorithm and this AI is actually having improvement. You start with something simple and then improve the AI over time. Have that data and metrics tell you, is it actually worth to use this more complex model? Is it not worth it? More data only matters if it's better data. We talked about that. Start with the simplest model possible and increase model complexity and data size in parallel. And then, very importantly also, connect the AI to the UI. And this kind of gets summarized in the five principles that I talked about at the beginning. This is kind of like a summary of the previous 11 in just five, right, that you make data trustworthy and accessible, 
follow hypothesis-driven offline online experimentation approach with clearly defined metrics, start from the simplest approach, and ensure that the AI improves over time with data metrics driving the improvement. More data only matters if it's better data and if the model is complex enough to learn from it. And then AI affects the user experience, but the user experience also affects the AI because of the learning loop. So with that, I'll leave you with, if you want further reading, there's a bunch of videos online of talk that I've given that focus on specific aspects of this talk. This talk was kind of a summary of a lot of things, and there's some that I focus on specific parts of it or specific papers. Uh, look at, there's a blog post for, about research at QRI where we talk in detail about all the different research that we're doing. And uh, yeah, with that, I'll open up for questions, but um, thanks so much for your attention. Talk. Um, so this is yeah, from uh, OSU, actually I'm from the medical school and my background is in recommender systems. So uh, my question is about your first work on diagnosis, uh, like diagnosis prediction. So you were saying that you add uh, synthetic data and noises to your data set and that helped. So um, I wonder if you can give us some more technical details about your synthetic data generation because as far as I know, like to generate synthetic medical data, that's not trivial, right? Because clinical variables are not independent and many, many patients are very different from others. And those patients are the ones that you want to make a better diagnosis. I wonder, I mean, um, how you generate synthetic data and how you guarantee that your synthetic data look real, like they are look realistic. And another question is about the noises. So we know like in EHRs, there have been a lot of noises and most of the times we have to clean the noises manually, clean, I mean, correct all the errors, remove all the noises manually, and now you are adding noises and you are saying that helped. So I wonder um, what is your um, insights about adding noises to already very noisy data? Yeah, great questions. So first of all, the, the, the question about how do we generate data, synthetic data that is truthful or is kind of like uh, it, it, we're able to learn from it. Um, an important thing to keep in mind is this knowledge basis that we're using uh, or expert systems um, are modeling all the different possible variables that are known to affect a possible diagnosis, right? Those even include demographics. So in other words, we're able to create synthetic data that says female, 25 years old, fever, and stomach cramps. What is the probability of the different uh, diagnosis? We excite different inputs to the network, and then the network produces an output, which is a case, and that's used as a ground truth. And it's used as a ground truth because that's what's been used for many years as a, as a ground truth. Those um, knowledge bases, if you think about it, they're just encoding in a graph a medical book. That's what really literally doctors that encode and work on that, uh, they do. They read a medical publication, they read the data, and they encode it into probabilities in the network. And we do the inverse. We now inject different things into the network, and that produces a probability of something happening. So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of data that is produced. Now, the data that is produced is very, you could argue, truthful because it's been encoded from books and doctors into this network, but it's also very idealistic. It doesn't contain noise. That's what I was saying, right? It's very much sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't expect uh, for the doctor to encounter situations in which the response to do you have fever is affected by a, a comorbidity that is called, right? If you're in medical school, you know there's comorbidities like, yeah, you could have fever because you have a different thing and that is affecting your diagnosis. So what we do is inject noise to actually recreate this natural noise that happens in reality when you ask patients 
about some symptoms. It, 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 we have different, if you read the paper, you'll see we have different kinds of noise. In some cases, we remove random findings because we are simulating the effect of doctors asking a patient for a symptom and the patient saying no because they don't really understand what they're, what they're answering, right? So there's different patterns and the response of the algorithm to different patterns, the only way that we have to see if it works is trying different noise strategies and seeing how, how it works. So that's, we're trying to simulate sort of real world. We're not trying to simulate noise in EHR, which is your second question. That's a completely different thing. There's noise in EHRs that is due to many different biases in the system. For example, we've worked with EHRs from different healthcare institutions. Uh, we have uh, published research with Stanford Medical School, for example. Um, the problem with noise in EHRs is that it's not random and it's very biased in ways that is completely unnatural because EHRs were designed for billing and then doctors have to encode things into EHRs that are related to the medical billing codes that they want to get paid for. And there's some things that are right, really completely off because of the actual goal of the encoding is not medical decision, it's really billing. And then removing that noise becomes extremely hard. We, we have been a little bit, at the end of the day, we decided <laughs> not to follow that track. We don't work with EHR data from standard EHRs. We do use our own EHR, and that's why our EHR has been designed from the ground up. We don't use uh, Epic or Cerner or any of the standards EHR. We design our own EHR from the ground up in order to encode medical information the right way with the goal of reasoning and encoding what's happening we don't care about the billing. I mean, the billing happens later, but it's not the goal. And we really focus on how to encode medical information. So, so when we use uh, data from our EHR, we can be certain that it's actually as truthful as possible. It might have noise, just like any data has noise, but that, that noise is more related to random processes or not uh, having written the, the right thing, but it's not really biases because the, the goal of the encoding process was only billing, for example. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, m my question is more on the business side of things. So, uh, I mean, the streets we were walking here, it, it has the FDA, the, the policymakers, and the insurance companies. Um, can you give me some concrete examples of like products and customers that you have? And like, what's your vision for the future or the median time to market for these kind of products, especially in the reasoning and diagnosis um, subspace uh, that, that you operate in? Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So yes, you're right, in, in, in healthcare, there are a lot of players in the ecosystem. and. It's hard to innovate quickly, right? And, and we're trying to do that in a way that uh, we, we, we do it quickly because we need to improve healthcare quickly, but at the same time responsibly, right? Because we, you, need to, you need to do the right thing and you need to have a lot of safeguards. The, the, I mean, I can't give you many examples. I can give you our example. The, the way that we do this is by basically making sure that there's always a doctor in the loop, right? So the doctor, is always there, is always making the final decision, and is always, always has the ability, because every, everything is encoded and written in the EHR and summarized and everything, always has the ability to go back and check, and there's no, mm, we're not removing the doctor at all, we're just making them more efficient. So the, the way that the AI is, is contemplated as a part of the medical team and enhancing and helping to make that more efficient that actually makes sort of like this loop and this decision-making process, collaborative decision-making process between the AI and the doctor happen much faster. At the same time, another benefit, another side effect, which is a benefit, is if the AI does the wrong thing or suggests the wrong thing, because the doctor overrules, we also get that feedback. So we, this enables us to retrain models and keep that sort of like training happening. So 
So I think the, the real key here is to enable that innovation by basically combining. It's not AI versus humans, it's AI and humans, right, making decisions and using the AI to sort of like enhance the cognitive ability, but also the efficiency of doctors, but keeping the doctors in the loop and in the team to basically um, make sure that the right thing is being done and also enhancing the AI over, over time. If you think about it, if uh, the AI is, is a member of the team, but it's almost like an intern, right? It's like you hire them, but they're just there. They know a lot, but they're learning, but they're also learning from the doctor. So you kind of like have this learning happening in both directions, which I think is, is really essential. Um, just a quick follow-up. Um, there are... <laughs> There's a lot of questions, I think. <laughs> sure, okay. Thank you for the great talk. So you talked a bit about um, generative models, which can output, let's say, truth, but can also output uh, hallucinations, what you called it, which may sound reasonable and be believable. And I think as this type of small types of models improve, uh, technology improves, it's maybe it will become more and more likely that for a human or clinician user of the AI system, it will be difficult to distinguish what is a, what is grounded in reality and what is a hallucination that sounds believable. And in that sense, like what you described just now, the doc, it would be harder and harder for the doctor to be the mitigating factor for these hallucinations to, to affect um, the patient uh, uh, treatment and um, management. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the danger is that uh, in the end, the hallucinations, what we call hallucinations, may influence the patient treatment and maybe would lead to a doctor making the wrong decision. So my, my question is about what uh, mitigating strategies or what mitigations we have in mind. Like what yeah. are your thoughts on mitigation basically? Yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a great question and one that I briefly touched upon. But um, maybe first let, 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 let me start by uh, at least getting some awareness uh, of the fact that this hallucination or this untruthfulness that we see in large language models also happens in humans, right? We've all seen experts and doctors during the pandemic saying all kinds of crazy things that are untrue. And it's, it, is, it is a problem. The problem of truthfulness is a problem for humans, let alone for trained AI, right? Because trained AI doesn't have uh, a sort of like a guiding principle of morality injected in it, so it just wants to sound good. Uh, but I will just maybe connect it to the notion of like, this is not, uh, th there's a lot of uh, situations where humans do the same thing. They just sound good. They, it seems like, gosh, this is a, you know, uh, a Stanford professor, but they're saying something that is not true. Now, I think that, that, that is why it's so important to have this notion of connecting it to a ground truth and to a knowledge that is shared and able to, uh, to retrieve somewhere, right? So this notion of, in our case, having a knowledge base, and you could argue the knowledge base is not perfect, just like a medical book is not perfect. I'm sure there's medical books that you read them, and particularly if they were written 10 years ago, you can probably find a, a lot of flaws and say, hey, this is not really the ground truth. The ground truth is really hard to obtain, but at least we need to have something that we can point to and say, okay, this is our ground truth. In our case, our ground truth is this knowledge base that is constructed and is updated constantly and is monitored by doctors and experts, and we keep sort of like constant mm, monitoring, right? Now, um, the, the, the problem with that knowledge base and this ground truth is that it's very static and it's very slow to update. So you can really adapt very quickly to things. So you need to keep updating it and you need to combine both things. So for example, going back to the uh, context of uh, COVID, for many months, nobody knew what the ground truth was because there was no ground truth, right? Like it was a novel situation the same thing was true in our case for the knowledge base. So I think what I'm going back to the question about language models, 
I think the, the bottom line is language models need to be subject to some constraints of ground truth that needs to be external. It can be injected in some ways and you can make it better, but still it's very hard to sort of like constrain it. One of the things, I don't know if people are aware, but language models are trained on such a tremendous amount of data that they have really literally read thousands of medical books. They have a lot of really good knowledge and they can retrieve it and it's very good. However, they've also read millions of Reddit threads, which has all kinds of crap, right? So they retrieve medical books and Reddit threads and they combine it in a way that it sounds good. Now, there are techniques to prime the models to go in the right direction and not go to the Reddit threads. And interestingly, prompt engineering that I was talking about is one, is you, if you write the right prompt, the language models tend to go more to the truthful facts than to the untruthful facts. But you can't really be sure. You still have to have that safeguard of an external ground truth, which in our case is a knowledge base, but could be something else where you're saying, okay, but then I need to check with my knowledge base and drive the conversation with something that has this notion of truthfulness. Thank you, uh, thank you for the talk. You the first lectures uh, talk about AI combined with UX and product design. I think I'd be appreciated because most people build AI do not think about the user interface. So I'm wondering if you can share some tips or tricks how would you build a UI that reflect the output from the AI? For, for example, is explainable AI? Because um, some of the uh, product, like you have an AI output coming out, and how would you explain that to the user so they can consume and understand they need to do certain things? So if you can, it'd be great. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, but probably we need another talk for that. <laughs> In fact, I've given, uh, uh, you reminded me, I, I gave a talk in, in, in a conference that was precisely about the intersection uh, between AI and UX. Uh, there's a conference called Intelligent User Interfaces with U, uh, IUI, which is about that. And um, it, it's a fascinating field and one that I think needs uh, a lot of uh, work and, and there's a lot of things that, that come to mind. I think the important aspect to keep in mind uh, is to have this deep collaboration between the product people or the UI people and the AI people because the feedback needs to go both ways. So as I mentioned in one of the principles is, is the AI impacts the UX and the UX impacts the AI and it goes both ways. We, we have, in, in, in the case of um, Curai, we have a very strong collaboration with between the AI researchers, the engineers, the product designers, and the doctors. And that loop is very close because we're designing features that are going to impact the usage, but the usage that those features are gonna have because they feed back into training the model also impact then what the model learns, right? So we need to be sort of like have that. So I think it is essential to, uh, to understand and to have this strong collaboration between the, the teams and the groups. And the best way that I know to do that, honestly, is you need experts who are working in between and understand both fields. So you, you need really good AI researchers, you need really good doctors, and then you need these unicorns that know a little bit about medicine and a little bit about AI and act sort of like as a, as a connectors between both teams. And those people uh, for us have been really, uh, really key. I mean, we have a, a team that we call clinical innovation, which is made of uh, clinical informaticists mostly. And there are doctors who understand medicine, of course, <laughs> and they also understand data science and AI. And of course, they're not as deep in AI algorithms as the AI researchers, but they're able to have that conversation. And the same thing happens uh, it's true for product, because the collaboration between product and AI, I see, I talk to companies where the product team doesn't have anyone who even 
knows what a logistic regression is, right? And you're like, oh gosh, and that you know, conversation, how is it gonna happen, right? If you start talking about feature engineering versus deep learning and how that's going to impact one particular feature, uh, I think you need to have sort of this ability to translate between both worlds. I don't know if I answer your question. Thanks, very cool stuff. I have two questions. One would be regarding the diagnostic system when you're comparing it to, to the performance of real physicians. You, I guess that's an average, or I think you mentioned over the three most uh, diagnosed diseases, but I'm curious to see how much heterogeneity is there. I guess there might be conditions where your system is much better than physicians and others where the opposite happens, and do you deal that with in any specific way? And my second question would be if you're working or will work with uh, other interventions besides the, the, the help in diagnostics. I'm thinking specifically about behavioral nudges, both could be both to the patients or, or, or the physicians. Yeah, great questions. So the first one about the, the way to evaluate diagnosis systems, is actually, it, it's, when, I, when I talk about it, I also I, I gave the ca caveat this is on the only known public data set that is out there, which is not as great as we would hope. Uh, there's a set of uh, medical vignettes uh, called the semigram vignettes, which were published by a researcher, semigram, I forgot her first name, sorry, but the, in, 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 a, in one of the papers she published, she released a data set of medical vignettes that have be become the standard of sort of like testing diagnosis algorithms. Uh, it's insufficient. I mean, I, I, I accept that. And in fact, <laughs> we're a startup and we can do many things, but I hope that at some point we are able to release a bigger data set and at least help in that sense. Because as I said, data drives improvements. And in the case of um, medical uh, decision making and diagnosis, we would need somebody to release a broader data set and have more ways to set that. So when we compare to humans, we're comparing on that same data set. There's been a number of studies that compare or that publish sort of like what is the average, um, what is the average accuracy of physicians with different metrics that you can compare to, including top one accuracy, top three accuracy, and different measures. I, were, I was using top three accuracy in that particular graph. Um, and the way that these experiments are done um, is by basically presenting the vignette to an, a bunch of different doctors and saying, okay, give me what is your differential diagnosis from one to 10, right? And then they, me they measure the performance. So we use those published results and we compare them to our own results. And that's the comparison. Uh, there's more details in one of the papers that I presented, but that's basically it. And the second question was, are, uh, are we going to apply these algorithms to behavioral health? Was that? Yeah, if you're, if you're planning to use the, the app to, to, for additional interventions maybe on, on the yeah, patients. Yeah. It's a great question. So our, our service is defined as primary care. Primary care is very broad <laughs> and it extends to a lot of different uh, areas. In fact, between you and me, uh, anxiety is one of our top five um, diagnoses because you know it's it's very common. And primary care physicians are usually the front line to many things. And there's a lot of mental health uh, issues that are being addressed at this point. And people don't have um, you know a, a therapist or a psychiatrist they go to. They go to their PCP, and many people don't have a PCP, so they go to Curi. So yes, uh, for that front line of, um, of mental health, we already are using it. However, because we can't do everything, we, we really don't cover, we're not a specialist in mental health. And in fact, what we do is um, we manage overall primary care. We do urgent care and primary care for an, a lot of different things, but then for specific uh, conditions, once you, uh, people need a specialist, we do referrals, and we do referrals to some of those specialists. Um, in the case of mental health, particularly, it's a very important aspect for us, and we're exploring 
collaborations with other existing specialized applications that do only mental health so we can integrate them in, into our system. So there, it will be more of an, a, co a collaboration rather than us taking care of specifically sort of like the end-to-end -end mental health because it's, it's a very broad uh, space and there's everything from anxiety to like very uh, deep and, and, and hard mental health problems to others that need uh, a psychiatrist and a specialist to, to, to drive. But yes, we do the front line of that. Excellent work and an excellent talk. My question is about uh, measures of impact of your app. Uh, so have you been measuring, have you been observing some improvement in, uh, in clinical metrics? Have you, have you found any challenges in uh, measuring the impact? Yes. <laughs> yes to all of the above, but it's a great question. It's, um, so measuring impact in the real world is very hard because of what I mentioned about needing long-term longitudinal data for not only three months, for, for usually for, for many months, and having metrics that you can trust that are representative of at least a, a enough diverse population, right? So we track, I mean, we have a, a medical uh, quality outcomes dashboard that is tracking, I don't know, many, like uh, probably in the order of 100 different metrics, right? Uh, and some are very specific. For example, we deal with patients that have hypertension. So we, we know that hypertension is a really, really big problem in primary care and in general for the population. And we track how our interventions improve uh, hypertension over time. Now that needs some time, and we do have data points, and we do have examples where we've been very successful. We also have examples where we haven't because we haven't managed to get the patient to comply enough to change the trajectory. Now, our goal is really to be able to get to a point that we can get significant enough measures on some of those to actually publish medical research. So all the research we've published so far is technical and is about AI, but we want to be able to publish medical research with outcomes that can be measured in a CRT, in a controlled randomized trial, and we can have sort of like real impact of how we're doing, at least in some of those conditions that we have a significant population and we can measure it. But the, the answer is we haven't done so. And we do have a, a very strong medical advisory board that includes uh, professors from medical schools uh, who are very well known and very knowledgeable in, in the space. And we're collaborating with them, uh, but we don't have, at this point, honestly, we don't have enough data and enough longitudinal data to be able to say we have a significant, you know, statistically significant impact on the outcome. But that is our, our goal, honestly. It's like, because that, at the end, the goal we want to have is to improve the life of this patient and show that we're doing so in a very efficient and cost-effective way. Yeah. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Um, I actually had a question about misdiagnosis when things go wrong. So let's say someone shows up with a headache and uh, they're diagnosed as migraine, they're given paracetamol and sent home, but it turns out to be a tumor in the head or whatever. Uh, I guess my question is, is there any way of sort of getting that feedback, let's say they show up three months later in another hospital for a surgery because they were not diagnosed three uh, months earlier. So do you sort of, are, are you able to link that data set to know that, okay, this person used your app um, at a doctor's clinic and then they showed up for surgery later because it failed? Uh, and secondly, when it does happen, where does the legal liability lie? Is it? Um, purely on the doctor's end with the medical malpractice or does the AI um, take some of it? Yeah, great question. So, so first of all, a very important aspect of misdiagnosis and a reason why in our case, we feel like we're in a much better position than the traditional healthcare system 
is because we have a much shorter and much tighter uh, feedback loop with the patient. So because it is based, it's mobile chat based, we can reach out to a patient m even multiple times a week. Very importantly, the reason a lot of the misdiagnosis happen in the traditional healthcare is because, okay, the, the doctor makes a mistake, doesn't ask the right question, or forgets something that they should have considered, and they misdiagnose, and they don't see the patient for six months. Now, that's, that's very hard, right? It's like, think about the difference in which you might have misdiagnosed, or basically you have a differential diagnosis, and you say, I don't know if it's a tumor or it's, if it's just a migraine. But you have, as a doctor and as a patient, the ability to say, okay, you know what? Let's try this. I'm gonna text you in two days, and I'm gonna continue uh, this process, and I'm gonna get different information as we go. That enables a lot of different, you, you can actually make a lot of different approaches to diagnosis that are much more safe than in the other setting. Uh, and in fact, uh, something that many people don't realize is that in the current uh, medical setting, a lot of the uh, treatments that are um, prescribed don't even contain a diagnosis they're called symptomatic uh, treatment, right? So basically, the doctor doesn't know what you have. They'll put in a code, but they don't really know. Uh, in our estimate, we analyze some data sets, it's 35% of the cases where doctors don't have a diagnosis, but they treat a symptom, and they say, well, if, you, you know, if you're coughing, this is gonna help with the cough. I don't really know what it is, but it's gonna cure the cough, so that's it. But if you have the ability to sort of like even do symptomatic treatment, we, even if you're not sure what are the, out of the three top, which one it is, but you can close the loop quickly, that becomes a much more safe and more, uh, a better thing to do. Your question was though, can we inject uh, mm, sort of feedback from external systems back into QRI? The answer is we can, but we can meaning that we, we are prepared technically and technologically to import and to get data from, uh, from external EHRs. We are integrated into an uh, external uh, data marketplace where we can connect and we can import. But the problem is that it really depends on the patient. If the patient goes and leaves and never uses QRI again, we can't just pull the data because we want to, right? So we need to have the collaboration of the patient and that sometimes is not always there. But the ability, technically it is, and we work, all, all our EHRs and everything are built on top of uh, healthcare standards. We use uh, the FHIR HL7 standard, which is like the uh, standard for interchange and exchange of information between healthcare institutions, and we can basically import and export anything but it does depend on having that collaboration. There was an, a last question, but I don't know if I, do I have time, you know? <laughs> what was the other question? Oh, the liability, yeah, great question, sorry. Yeah, the liability uh, is on the doctor. So the doc, uh, we, as I said, we always keep the doctor in the loop, and the lo doctor is the one who signs the diagnosis and the treatment, and they, are trained and they're made responsible for making that decision. And they can't um, sort of like assume that the AI is giving them the right decision. And in fact, that's why most of the time our UI, going back to the relation between the AI uh, and the UI, our UI is designed in such a way that we give doctors the top N recommendations. We don't give them the one and like, oh, this is definitely COVID, right? We just give them the top N with some likelihood, but they're, they're the ones that are making the right decision. And in fact, we also encourage them, I didn't talk, I mean, it would be very long, but we also encourage them to even ask further questions. When they get a diagnosis, they also get a suggestion of other questions they could ask if they wanna go farther and make sure that it's not something. And our UX and even enables them to say, hey, I wanna make sure it's not a brain tumor. And then 
the UX highlights some good questions they could ask if they really want to rule out that particular condition. Even if brain tumor is number five, right? They could still select and say, hey, I'm really worried about this. Can I ask better questions? And we suggest questions to rule out that particular condition. But at the end, the liability is on the doctor because they need to make sure that they're making the right decision. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk and <laughs> staying for all the questions. So uh, my question is more about, uh, about like the bias in the model and especially how it affects users from different, uh, different user groups, like different ages or backgrounds. And in particular about like the, since the model is kind of starts uh, trained from some synthetic data. So in some of our work, it's, uh, we are also deriving some conversational agents. It's not specifically to health domain, but it's like helping people with daily tasks. And since we also don't have a lot of like uh, silver data, so we also try to uh, like bootstrap a model from like uh, uh, synthetic data from some knowledge bases. But what we notice when, I, when we put the system online is that it doesn't perform very well. And what we notice is like, okay, uh, synthetic data, when it's generated, it's based on a lot of rules and templates. And the rules template is basically, uh, we are a, a bunch of CS PhD students. And a lot of us are not naive English speakers, but we come up with all those templates and rules and try to like get some data to train the model. But when we put the model online, we notice a lot of like uh, people from different backgrounds, and this is even just in US, like people from different grounds, and they are like even kids talk to our uh, system. So I wonder like whether you have also experienced like similar uh, similar situations and how your system uh, solving this. Yes. <laughs> It's a great question, and it's a very important issue. And it's an issue that goes back in medicine like uh, centuries. Uh, so it's not only about the data that we have, it's even about uh, the expert systems that I was alluding to before, they are actually biased because they are designed by people, let's say in privilege, uh, situations by looking at populations that are usually pretty biased in the same direction and uh, writing books or reading books that have been also looking at medical research uh, that has traditionally been biased and we don't have data on underserved populations. And that's very important, particularly for us. Our product is addressing, I didn't mention this, but is really addressing um, people that are underinsured, underserved, and we do get a lot of diverse population that are not well represented in general in, in medicine and even in some of the old data, right? So we, we are aware, uh, we are careful about it, and we, when we generate synthetic data, we try to inject bias in the opposite direction to make sure that we get enough representation. Now that being said, we know that we need to be monitoring that very careful and uh, we have, we actually have a tool, an internal tool, uh, we call it strange case, but it's a tool that monitors the performance of our algorithms on different populations. And for example, when we update a model, it does report if all of a sudden the model has become worse on say a particular gender, a particular race, a particular ethnicity, it does automatically report on us like, hey, maybe your accuracy on the model is great overall, but it has created this bias on this population. So it is, I don't, I don't have a, a great solution for you like saying, oh, this is how you fix the problem. What I can tell you is you need to be aware of the problem and you need to monitor it and then act on it because it is, it is true that all the data that is out there it is biased in, in the same direction. We, we are quote unquote lucky that our whole medical team and people that work at QRI are very much on top and aware and we are tracking, we are tracking the, but if you just blindly use the data and you train for it, uh, you are likely to get this kind of biases for sure. So it, it is important to, to keep it in mind. Thank you. I'll be around, they can ask me. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.